today we're going to begin our study of the book of Ruth. For the past several weeks, we've been studying the book of Judges. And in earlier times, the canon of the Bible actually put the book of Ruth at the end of the book of Judges. So it's quite natural for us to be able to study this book at this time. It's a very special book for me because uh, my grandmother's name was Ruth. And so when I, when I think about this book, I think about my grandma. We're going to spend the next two weeks studying the book of Ruth. And, you know, if you're looking for a title, it, it could simply be Three Funerals and a Wedding. It starts off with three funerals and ends in an incredible wedding of Boaz and, of course, Ruth. We find that Naomi, one of the protagonists in the book, moves from bitterness to blessedness, and Ruth from loneliness to love. Truly, it's a great picture of God's grace. Let's turn to Ruth, chapter 1. All right, honey, come on. In Ruth 1, we simply read this. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Well, first of all, we do find that this takes place in the time of the judges. And as our last few weeks study in the book of Judges, we realize that the latter part of the book of Judges was not chronological. And yet, this probably is chronological to the last section of the book of Judges, where we talked about the Benjamite massacre. Now the question must come, well, where does this fall in the book of Judges? Well, really, one of the clues is in the very first sentence right there. It says, there was a famine in the land. Most likely, it occurs right during the time of Gideon. Turn to Judges chapter 6. Let's see if we can match this on up. It says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples, that would be the Moabites, invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and didn't spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkey. They came up with the livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites, they cried out to the Lord for help. You know, right here it says that the occupation of the Midianites and the other eastern peoples lasted seven years. And the sojourn, as we read down here in verse 4, of Naomi and her family was ten years. And so it matches up very well. So we find that... Bethlehem and all of Israel has been invaded by the eastern peoples. What's happened? I mean, all the crops are ruined. They've intentionally ruined the crops. And so what happens? There's a famine in the land. Now, we have to ask ourselves, well, who is the probable writer? Most think Samuel or one of his fellow prophets, Hezekiah, Ezra. But some have said David. I think it was David's influence most likely, on Samuel. Because, you see, you've got to explain something very special about David. His great-grandma was Ruth the Moabite. Turn to Ruth chapter 4. In verse 16, Then Naomi took the child of Boaz and Ruth and laid him in her lap and cared for him. The woman living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. And he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. The book ends with the genealogy, and so you'd have to say this was the purpose for the book. To explain why David, King David, the Messiah of the Old Testament, had a Moabite in his lineage. And yet we'll find from the book itself that this was a very, very special lady. And we'll find that the providence of God was not only on her, but on her ancestry. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 22. Perhaps the lowest point 
in David's life before he became king happened when Saul was pursuing him. And he literally was all alone. And he went to the cave of Adalim. You remember the story? This is chapter 22, verse 1. Here it is. I never saw this before. You guys got to see this. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adalim. When his brothers and father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress, in debt, or discontented gathered around him, and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. From there, David went to Mizpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? So he left them with the king of Moab and stayed with them as long as David was in the stronghold. This is incredible. Right here at David's lowest point, Saul is after him. All Israel despises him. Yet his family starts coming to him there in the cave of Adullam. And then about 400 other guys come. Everybody that was in debt, in distress, and discontented under Saul's leadership. And the Bible moves the heart of David. He says, I've got to take care of my family. And it comes to him. Israel's no longer my family. I'll take them back to my ancestry. I'll take them back to great grandma's place in Moab. And so he took Jesse, who absolutely would have known his grandmother, Ruth. And so they go, and Moab becomes the surrogate family for the family of the future King David. Because Israel had totally deserted David. And David now returns to Moab. Yes, I think it's to explain David's lineage. And I think that we'll see that God picked a very special lady to be David's great-grandma. The title of our lesson today is Under His Wings. We have three points. Number one, forever together. Number two, good luck is God's blessings. And number three, God picks your family. Amen? Forever together. Let's go back to the book of Ruth, chapter 1. I hope we'll have a little fun today studying the Bible. In verse 1, chapter 1 again. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they'd lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilion died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husbands. Right here, one of the things that I think few people understand is that when Naomi and Elimelech left Bethlehem, left Israel, they were, so to speak, falling away from God. We'll find in chapter 4 that they had an inheritance in Israel, land in other words. And they were leaving their inheritance. And you say, well, but, but there was a famine in the land. It's true there was a famine in the land, but there's never any reason to leave the inheritance of God. Secondly, we find some irony in some of the names. They left Bethlehem. Bethlehem literally means house of bread. So they leave the house of bread, Bethlehem, to go to a foreign land outside of Israel. Elimelech means God is king. Naomi means gracious or pleasant with the idea that God is pleasant, God is gracious. Get this, the son's name. Malon means weakly or sickly. Kilion means decay or death. You say, man, you name your kid that? Well, historically, the Hebrews would name their kids that really surmised where they were at in life. So, one of the most famous kids, of course, is the grandson of Eli. His name was Ichabod. And Ichabod means the glory has left Israel. That was the same day the ark was taken by the Philistines. Now, I would not 
perhaps choose or suggest that you would choose the name Malon weekly or Kilion dead for your kid. But hopefully today you will not have to even consider that. Orpah, one of the, the wives, means literally turn back. And Ruth literally means friend. Isn't that incredible how everybody fulfilled their destiny? <laughs> now some have suggested that marriage to the Moabites was not forbidden. And yet after careful study, absolutely it was forbidden. You were not to marry outside of the people of God. Interesting right here, in what looks like a repetitious statement in verse 2, the Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. Well, the old name of Bethlehem was Ephrath. So you're saying, sort of be like us saying, an Angelino from Los Angeles. But it was very important because remember now, this book was originally at the end of the book of Judges. And at the end of the book of Judges, it talks about Bethlehem a lot. One of the ones was talking about the Levite that lived in Bethlehem, but he wasn't really from Bethlehem, but he lived there. That, of course, was Jonathan, the grandson of Moses, who becomes a false preacher up in Dan. You remember that? And the other one, of course, got his concubine from Bethlehem right there. And so what the writer is really saying right here is this guy was of the family that originally got the inheritance there in Bethlehem, re-emphasizing he got the inheritance, the promised land of God. He was an Ephrathite. He was an original Bethlehem guy. Now, it's interesting, I think, right here, this next statement, verse 6. It says, When Naomi heard Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. Wow, this is incredible. God did provide for his people in Israel. And, of course, we know the story of Gideon right here. And it reemphasizes all the more that by leaving Israel and living in Moab, they had left God. And yet she saw that the people of God, the people that had stayed in Israel, were blessed by God because God always blesses his people when they turn to him. Amen, church? And so we find a very interesting thing right here. Elimelech dies. The boys marry. They marry Ruth and Orpha. And the older one married Ruth. And then the two boys die. And Ruth then hears, Wow! God is back in Israel. God is providing food there. I need to go back. And daughters-in-law, you'll come with me. So let's read on right here. Verse 7. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. So at this point, they're heading back to Bethlehem, all three of them. Verse 8. Then Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown your dead to me. May the Lord grant that each of you find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud and they said to her, We'll go with you back to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? Who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone against me. Do you sense kind of a bitterness in her right there? What she was saying, says, it's just too late for me. See, under the Jewish law and tradition, if a daughter-in-law's husband died, then a brother could marry her. Well, of course, both brothers died. And she's saying, hold it. Even if I had a husband, even if I could see the child tonight, it would take him years to grow on up, and I'm not going to get married anyway. I mean, my life is so bitter. Let's read on. Verse 18. At this they wept again. Then Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. This is how far out there Naomi got. She says, just go back to your own gods. You know, when you leave God, you get so liberal doctrinally about what is the truth. You'll be okay with your gods. But this is it, guys. Verse 16. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I'll be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. 
When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. What incredible words. What a special woman. Here, here she actually sees her sister-in-law turn and go back to Moab. And she turns to Naomi who's saying, please go back and join your sister-in-law. It'll be better for you there. And she goes, absolutely not. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, that gets me free fired up right there. <laughs> the idea of stay right there is not a destination, but an overnight. And so carried with this, this Ruth is saying, wherever your pilgrimage takes you, I am forever together with you. You know, we have a very special couple in our church, Tommy and Sandra Gaines. This past week, they celebrated their 32nd wedding anniversary. Is that cranking, guys? Talk about, talk about together forever. That's awesome. Elaine and I are about a year behind him. I, I'm, I'm sure we will not catch up, but amen. You know, the exciting thing that we see right here, though, is we see that even with Naomi bitter towards her situation, she is still of a mind that she has to return to Israel. She has to return to God. Even Ruth understands that to return to Israel is to return to the God of Israel, to the people of Israel. She says, listen, your people will be my people and your God, my God. This was a very special Moabite woman. You know, we've been having a lot of fun in our first principles class. Amen, class? And I'm really proud of all the people. And yesterday we studied out in a discipleship study, really, what, what was in the heart of Ruth. You know, Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, He says, if anyone would come after me, he must hate his father, his mother, his wife, his brother and sister. Yea, even his own life, or he cannot be my disciple. And we talked about that the word hate was not animosity, because the Bible talks about honoring your father and your mother and loving your enemy. But it does mean the degree of loving less. And right here we see that heart inside of Ruth says, listen, I will love your God and I will love your people more than my gods, more than my people. This is the vow I am making. You know, it was really cool. Last week we had the uh, Hollywood House Church. And uh, DJ did a fantastic job preaching as he always does. And, and it, was, it, was, it was so powerful to see Damon and Vicky restored to the Lord. Yet the thing that what really hit me, though, was Jackie Munoz's baptism. And uh, Jackie is just an incredible lady. And you talk about having to go through a lot of struggles to enter the kingdom of God. That was Jackie. But here's what she had to do. She had to make the decision. I am going to follow God no matter what anyone in my family thinks. And after struggling through that decision, she not only made that decision with no sentimentality, but then so many of her family showed on up for the baptism. See, a lot of us, we want our family to be able to follow us. And we, we want our family to have what we have. But we get sentimental with them. We compromise with them. And we wonder, why don't they ever come around? you got to have the commitment of Ruth to your God. You have to have a sense that no matter what happens... God will be your God and God's people will be your people. Because only when you have a position of total commitment will you be able to bring people from a position of compromise to your position. Anybody that tries to compromise people to commitment will always fail. Because they've got to see where you are. And that's why I think Jackie is going to be an abundantly fruitful sister. Not only with many of her friends, but inside of her own family. Amen, church? You see, we need to understand that with God and with true spiritual Israel, we are forever together. Amen, guys? Our second point, good luck is God's blessings. At least that's what the atheists call God's blessings. Oh, just had a lot of good luck. Well, let's continue to read. Chapter 1, 
Verse 19. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. I love the King James Version right here. It says, and so the two women trudged on. (laughs) You see them going like this. Until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, Could this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Lord Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought this fortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabites, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Well, you know, if you understand the names right here, it, it's pretty humorous. She comes on in the city, and she her looks hadn't changed that much in ten years, which is better than some of us. Oh, but hadn't changed. Everybody goes, oh, it's it's Naomi, it's Naomi. And of course, her names mean pleasant. Pleasant is God. And so she hears in the crowd all the whispering, it's Naomi, it's Naomi. She goes, I am not Naomi. I am Mara. And Mara means bitter. (laughs) Don't call me Naomi. I'm bitter and I enjoy it. (laughs) Here's the interesting thing. Look at verse 21. I find this fascinating. She says, I'm bitter because God has afflicted me. She blamed her bitterness on God. Number two, she says, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Now let's think about this a second. She went away full? No! She went away from the land of God. Where in time, in seven short years, God would deliver them through Gideon and give them plenty of food. She left with nothing but trying to leave the famine. And you may leave a famine, but you can never leave God or death. And so when she got in the land of Moab, she lost her husband and her two boys. But her view was, man, I left full and I returned empty. She's forgetting she was coming back to Bethlehem, the house of bread. The barley harvest was just starting. That meant not only were they going to be able to have the barley harvest, but then the wheat harvest right afterwards. It's awesome time to come back, wouldn't you say? And now she had this daughter-in-law that was more loyal than anybody she'd ever met. And she says, but I've come back empty. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3, this... See to it, brothers, in verse 12, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. See, the sin of bitterness had deceived her. She looked back at leaving Israel and going to Moab. I was full. No, she wasn't. And so many people, when they leave God, when they leave the Lord, they go back, you know, man, I I, I had it so rotten back then. It's like the Israelites, when they left Egypt, they go, man, Egypt was such a great spot. (laughs) That's how a lot of people are. They say, man, my old life was so awesome. And they forgot the slavery of sin and all the sin that hurt them. And so her bitterness caused her to be deceived about why she left Israel And even her present state when she came back. See, I think we've really got to ask ourselves. And I appreciate Chuck getting on up there and just getting open. Say, even though we're all in Israel today, is there any bitterness in your heart? If there's bitterness in your heart, it's because you have not submitted to the will of God. You see, the world would have said it was just good luck. That she found Ruth. It was just good luck that the timing she came on back to Bethlehem at the barley harvest. It was just good luck the Israelites had tossed off all the eastern people. And let's read on right here. In verse 1. Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech. A man of standing whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite says to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone whose eyes I find favor. 
Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Good luck, right? She just lucked out. She was in Boaz's field. No, it was God. It was the providence of God that brought her into Boaz's field. Is that flat awesome, guys? We need to understand and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 29. It's a powerful, powerful verse about bitterness. In verse 18, Moses says, Make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today, whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and worship the gods of other nations. Make sure there is no root among you that produces such bitter poison. See, when we turn away from our God, when we turn away from spiritual Israel, in time it will produce a bitter poison in our hearts. And if we don't deal with that poison, it will eat us up. It will destroy our lives. And that's exactly what happened to Naomi's family. They called the oldest son sickly. They called the younger son death. And that's the kind of life you live if you are outside of Jesus Christ. That was the condition that their lives fell into. Well, right here, back in Ruth, we find that the Holy Spirit takes Ruth to Boaz's field and she... Begins to glean the field. What does it mean to glean the fields? Well, Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10, it talks about it. It's that you're going back after everything is harvested and you're picking up the leftovers. And God commands the Israelites, never glean your fields. Because you have to take care of the poor and the alien. Let there be the leftovers for them to take care of them. And so this is what Ruth did. I mean, she was, in their eyes, still a foreigner, even though she had come to worship Jehovah God. And so she's allowed to glean the fields. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. In Proverbs 3, we really see the kind of heart that Ruth had. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes, and fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your bonds will be filled with overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. God says, when you turn to me, I'm going to take care of you. But if you don't turn to me, I'm not going to take care of you. That vow is broken because you broke the vow, not God. Right here, God begins to take care of Ruth, and we'll see in a few minutes, and Naomi. He was taking care of Boaz because all these people had turned back to God. You know, one of the things I, I, I really want to commend the church here. We had our, our uh, devotional on giving a couple weeks ago. And uh, we had... We just laid it on out that in order to be a congregation that is self-supporting, we have to give about nine to $10,000 a week, and we have to have a special Thanksgiving contribution in order to cover everything, and then we should be good to go, as all mission plantings do. Well, I was very pleased. I mean, our giving just in one week's time went up way over $1,000, $1,200. So I, I want to commend you for your generosity. Secondly, I, I want to really lay it on out there. Let us not stop being generous, but let's begin to lay aside for the Lord the ten times contribution or more that we can do in order to get the church self-supporting by Thanksgiving time. Amen? Amen. And that will be truly a thanksgiving to God. Right. You know, it's kind of interesting right here. As we read on in the book of Ruth, what happens as she's gleaning. Verse 4. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. Boaz asked the foreman of the harvest, Whose young woman is that? The foreman replied, She's the Moabites who came from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Evidently there was a pretty big age gap right here. My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along with the girls. I've told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink of water from the jars the men have filled. 
At this she bowed down to face the ground. She exclaimed, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father, your mother, your homeland, and came to live with the people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now, at this point, I think Boaz already likes her. (laughs) So he's kind of helping her on out. And he offers her water and he extends his graciousness to her. And then we have kind of almost the benediction right here. He says in verse 12, May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel. So the writer is trying to say, hold it. This woman deserves the blessings of God. He says, May the God of Israel, under whose wings you come, take you refuge. Now, for a lot of us, we go, under whose wings? I, I don't understand that. Well, believe it or not, it's used three times in the book of Psalms. But the real understanding of it comes when we understand the ark of God. Go back to Exodus chapter 25. Now, a lot of you guys, the ark of God, what's that? Remember the movie, The Lost Ark? That's that ark. <laughs> it's the ark of God. It's where the presence of God was. And of course, in chapter 25, it's when the Lord, through inspiring Moses, tells them how to build the ark. In verse 10, we simply read this. Have them make a chest of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Okay, so that's the dimensions of it. Drop down to verse 16. Then put in the ark the testimony which I gave you. This is the book of the law. Verse 17. Make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long, and a cubit and a half wide. In other words, make a covering. And make two cherubim, two angels, out of hammered gold at the ends of the covers. Make one cherub on one end, and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherub of one piece with the cover at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward. Can you kind of picture that? The two angels will face each other, and the wings are spread upwards, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherim are to face each other, looking towards the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark and put in the ark the testimony, which I will give you. Therefore, above the cover, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet with you and you all my commands for the Israelites. So, you have the chest, the ark. They make the cover. You had the two angels facing each other on the cover with their wings spread upward. And right here, the Lord inspires Moses saying, When I meet with you, I'm going to meet with you right underneath the wings of the cherubim. And so he's talking about this intimate relationship with God. And so, when Boaz tells Ruth, May the Lord have you under his wings, he's saying, May you forever be in an intimate relationship with God because there's no more secure place to be than that. Amen, church? You know, uh, when I think about coming under the Lord's wing, I have to now think about Chuck and Terry Roy. You got a chance to to meet Chuck here just a a few minutes ago and you see his heart for God. And uh, it's, 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 it's really pretty incredible. Um, Chuck was baptized in 1999, and he came in the kingdom with, with a lot of baggage, like a lot of us. At that point, he was in his third failed marriage. When he met Terry, still was married technically, and she had already had two failed marriages. And I asked him if I could share this today. They said, well, I'll just share anything. It'll probably help somebody out there. And only after seeing that a fourth marriage for him, a third marriage for her, was not what produced happiness, did they begin to really search for God. Lupe Sanchez was a friend of theirs. As a matter of fact, came to a Bible study that Chuck led. He says, you gotta, you got to talk to Lordy. She's awesome. <laughs> well, talk to Lordy. Then Lordy called me on up and I had a chance to go out and visit. And we had a short four-hour Bible study just talking about 
what it meant to follow the Lord. And then, of course, you heard about Victor coming. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the Lord always sends into our lives exactly the right guy. You know what I'm talking about? If he sent Victor Gonzalez into your life, you really need a lot of work, Chuck. Amen? <laughs> but what's so incredible is that here in the midst of his fourth marriage, God sends in a person to give him hope. To return him under the wings of God into that intimate relationship. And today you got to hear that testimony. What's equally exciting is at the end of the service, Tara will be coming forward and she's going to be baptized into Christ. Yeah. You see, here, here's what we need to understand. There is no sin. There is nothing we can do that God will not forgive if we are willing to return to Him. And though our lives may seem a mess and it may seem like we can't straighten it on out, and let me tell you, you can't, God can straighten it on out and fix it on up and heal it on up. Is that exciting, guys? You see, for Naomi, she looked at the situation and says, Man, I'm so bitter returning here. I left here full. I've returned empty. She was deceived by her bitterness. She brought the daughter-in-law. She came at the barley harvest. And now, just good luck, Ruth gleaned in Boaz's field. Now, good luck is only for atheists. We believe in the blessing of God. That God blesses us, as David said, according to our righteousness. Let's move on to our last point. God picks your family. In the book of Ruth, we pick it up in chapter 2, in verse 13. Ruth is talking. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort and spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here. Have some bread. Dip it in wine vinegar. He was, he was taking care of her. Now, that may not sound so cool to us. Have some wine vinegar. <laughs> actually, this was a very refreshing drink at that time. It was actually a very similar drink that Jesus was offered by the Roman soldier on the cross. And what it was, it was kind of the modern-day... Mountain Dew, okay? Is that it was very refreshing and cooling. And so he's, he's saying, here, let me give you some refreshment right here, this wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered some roasted grain. Now that's pretty cool. It most likely was corn. And what it was that people would pick the corn when it was a little bit green and they would keep it. And then when they wanted to eat it, what they do is they keep it on the stalk and put it in the fire and roast it. Of course, the fire would burn away the chaff and everything, and you kind of have roasted corn. Not quite popcorn, but roasted corn. So he, he fixes that for her. And we read this. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. Rather, pull out some of the stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. I mean, let me tell you something. This guy was taking care of this woman. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she'd gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she'd gathered. Ruth also brought out, and she gave her what she had left over after she'd eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, Where did you clean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who noticed you. She knew something happened that day. <laughs> How much, how much barley, I mean, was this? It was, it was a lot. We understand from uh, Exodus chapter 16 that an omar was basically a man's portion of food. And Ephath is ten omars, okay? So she's ground up enough food for ten guys to eat. So she's done this from gleaning now. So when Naomi sees her coming back with all the stuff, she goes, whose field did you glean in? Somebody noticed you today. <laughs> then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the, the one at whose place she'd been working. The name of the man I work with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing 
kindness to the living and the dead, she said. That man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it'll be good for you, my daughter, to go with his girls because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the servant girls of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvest were finished and she lived with her mother-in-law. I'd say things were looking up for Naomi. What do you think? You know, it, it is incredible to think that God has a purpose for everyone. In Acts 17, he says he appoints the exact times and places that we live so that we would begin to seek him, reach out for him, and find him. Right here is no different than Ruth and Boaz. You know, in some ways, for a lot of people, who Boaz is escapes them. But let's look at another genealogy and see if we can figure out who this dude is. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1 in the genealogy of Jesus. Now remember, the book most likely was written in defense of David's lineage to a Moabite. And she was quite a woman, and she was totally converted to Jehovah God, was she not? Now, we also remember from Matthew 1 that David was special because he is in the lineage of Jesus. Matthew 1 talks about the lineage of Jesus. It talks about all the men in that lineage, except for five women. In verse 3, it says, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Tamar conceived those twins through incest with her father-in-law. But she was in the lineage of Jesus. Verse 5, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, the prostitute. Boaz's mom was Rahab. Wow. So in the lineage of Jesus, we have a prostitute. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. We have a Moabite. Verse 6. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Ah, couldn't even mention the name Bathsheba, the adulteress. And the fifth woman, verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. In the eyes of the world, she was a single mother. This was the lineage of Jesus. These were the women that God wanted to show, I care so much about you. I want to genetically weave my son from who you are. See, Boaz was a very special man. Can you think about it? His mom was Rahab the prostitute. He was a woman that knew so many men, and yet because of her faith, turned to the God of Israel and delivered into the hands of the Israelite the city of Jericho. One of their greatest victories. And now Boaz stands in the lineage, not only of David, but the lineage of Jesus. See, it wasn't by chance that Ruth wandered into that field. God was providentially behind it. There's no such thing as good luck. You know, what's really kind of interesting is God has chosen your DNA. The Bible says he's woven you in your mother's womb. And you thought he made a mistake with that nose, didn't you? <laughs> now, he wove that DNA, got everything all together, and he knew you were going to be bald at 25, Nick. That was it, you know. He made you tall, he made you small, he made you a little bit wider, but oh well. God made you white, God made you black. Whoever you are, God made you perfectly for his purposes. And the reason we get so dissatisfied of ourselves is that we are not within the purpose and therefore the will of God. You know, we had a, a great time yesterday uh, getting, as usual, with Mike Underhill and Rachel Bond, who lead our teen ministry here at the church. And uh, we got together at 6.30 in the morning with them, with uh, DJ and Casey, because we're handing over the teen ministry to be discipled by DJ and Casey. And uh, I want to have a little Bible study with the four of them so that we can all be united about the teen ministry. And I want to share some, 
some of that with you guys. So, the theme for our team ministry comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In verse 19, Paul writes, Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. And I said, okay, Rachel, Michael, you're teen workers, you're leading the teen ministry, you've got to have the mindset of a slave. <laughs> Let's face it, we were all teens at one time, amen guys? And if there's a group that takes things for granted about everybody doing stuff for them, it's teenagers. And if you're going to be a teen worker, you've got to flat be a slave. And be willing to spend your money on food for them, Starbucks for them, movies for them, on gas to drive way over there to them. You got to just be a slave of Jesus Christ. Verse 20. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under law I became like one under law, though I myself am not under law, so as to win those under law. To those not having law I became like one not having law, though I'm not free from God's law, but under God, Christ's law, so as to win not having law. To the weak I became weak to win the weak. I become all things to all men. So by all possible means I might save some. I do all of this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. So the theme for our youth ministry is to win as many as possible. But it's very interesting. In evangelism, Paul had priorities that God gave him. To the Jew first and then the Gentile. It's very interesting. I really believe that's the kind of priorities that we need to have in our teen ministry. The Jews, in my opinion, are most analogous to the kingdom kids. The kids raised in the church. But we also got to save the Gentiles, all those teenagers outside of the church. Amen? And, you know, the kingdom kids, they're, they're awesome. I mean, Mike Underhill is a kingdom kid. Rachel Bond is a kingdom kid. And today, her little brother's getting baptized in Portland. Is that awesome? And the thing that was it's kind of amazing is that just, just a couple of days ago, Rachel's dad, Jason, called me and says, Bro, I just got to thank you. Thank you for just having me come to Portland and be here. My family's been so blessed. Rachel and now Ryan's getting baptized today. It's very special because Ryan is a special needs kid. But you start seeing the impact of what happens when a kingdom kid is baptized into Christ like... Alex Mendoza today is going to fire up his whole family. It brings joy to his family. But what heartbreak does it bring to the family when a kid doesn't get baptized? Or a kid who's baptized leaves the Lord? What a heartbreak! Because for us who are disciples, Jesus is everything. Or at least He should be. And so, when Mike Underhill returned to the Lord after having lived with a girl and being a bartender. And he was restored to Christ. In May, the whole Underhill family rejoiced. Today, with little Sonia getting on up here, coming back to the Lord, let me tell you something, the whole Gonzalez clan rejoiced on that one. And, you know, we get with, we get with Victor and, 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 and Sonia every week as disciples. And, you know, Victor's very stoic. I'd have to agree with Chuck a little bit, a little bit green berets. But, I mean, Sonia just wears her heart in her sleeve. And any time one of the kids is struggling or hurting, she just cries for him. But, you know, when it came to be the news that Sonia was coming back for God... She was so lifted up. She was flying. She was flying. So, yesterday, DJ, Casey, Mike, Rachel, Elena, we talked about how the kingdom kids are a priority. We talked about, hey, you've got to go after this kids. Now, for a lot of people that get baptized in the church, they go, oh man, they're so lucky. They got they got born into a Christian family. I can't understand why they're on the back row looking like they lost their three best friends and they want to murder somebody. <laughs> this is, I can't understand this. I'm so, I feel I found God. I found the church. I'm just so flat fired up. What is wrong with that kid? <laughs> now, for many 
years we've wrongly placed blame on the parents. Why, why would a kingdom kid be bitter? Because he's being called to a life he doesn't want to live. They're worldly poles. Thank you, Mike Underhill. They're worldly poles and he doesn't want to do it. See, people are bitter when they're called to live a life they don't want to live. And they're fighting against God. I appreciate Sonia Gonzalez. She came on over to the house last week. She says, I need to talk to you and Elena. Go, hey, man. What do you want to talk about? She says, well, I want to get restored, but I know I have to apologize to you. And there was one particular incident. She had to apologize. I was leading a teen devotional in Portland. And all of a sudden, right at the end of the devotional, I still wasn't finished. Sonia and another girl get up and they walk right in front of me. I go, excuse me, ladies. Where are you going? We're going to the bathroom. Go, no, you're not. I'm not done speaking and that's disrespectful. Go sit down. But I'm really going to go. I said, I'm not done. Go sit down. I'll be done in five minutes. Go back there and just steaming mad. I hate that preacher. <laughs> But you know, there got to be some lines right there. You know what I'm talking about, guys? But on the other hand, we got to learn as a church to love the kingdom kids. Even when they don't want to be hugged. Or loved or cared for. Because God is still at work in their life. And God is coming to get them. And in His providence, He's going to have them wander into Boaz Fields. Or maybe he'll have them wander into a bad field. And they'll go, man, I really need the Lord. But God is at work. And we need to have a conviction, guys. There's a church. We're going to love these kingdom kids into the family of God. Number two, we're still going to go after the Gentiles. We're going to go after all these young people out there that are just so enslaved to sin. What a tough time not to be with God in your teen years. Are you with me right here? See, we need to have deep convictions about what it takes. For those in, in, in the church here that, that are hurting because your child is not yet baptized or, or your child has wandered away from God, the worst thing you can do is give in. Be solemn. Be bitter. Because you're saddened by that situation. You have got to celebrate Jesus Christ and live the kind of life that eventually your kid goes, Daggone it, I want to be just like you. It was kind of cool. Yes, they have first principles. We had a little extra time because Saturday. And the group that's been doing the best is the uh, campus and teen group that Aurora leads. And I think they call it something like the, the fearless uh, flame putter quenchers. Fearless flame quenchers. So I said, okay, let's have these girls come on up right here. And we'll, we'll exclude Aurora right here. But I kind of put them on the spot and I said, okay, uh, girls, tell me what your idea of the perfect Christian husband is going to be. <laughs> oh, man, there's some real uptightness right there. And Sonia's going, not me first, not me first. I go, okay, we'll start at the end. So I went all the way through, and they just shared who it was. Finally, we get to, to, to little Sonia. And she goes, my idea of the perfect Christian husband is a man just like my dad. Now, beforehand, there were battles. And there was bitterness. She didn't want to live that life. And she was resentful that she had Victor and Sonia for her dad. How dare God place me in this family? I don't like. I don't want to be a Christian right now. But so I appreciate Victor and Sonia taking their stand joyfully for Jesus Christ, remaining faithful parents, and now their daughter wants a husband just like Daddy. See, we've got to learn to persevere. God has picked our family. Turn to one last scripture that I showed him yesterday. Yeah. Talking about the teen ministry. This is super encouraging. Romans chapter 1. In Romans 1, verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because of the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. 
First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Once more, this is the prioritization of the Jew and the Gentile. And I just, I shared with the gang, I said, what Paul says right here is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God. The word power there in Greek is where we get our English word dynamite. The gospel is the dynamite of God. Is that awesome? That means it can change anybody. Even people you think, oh, no, he's never going to come around. No, 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 she'll never come around. She'll never change that bitterness. He'll never change. Let me tell you something. Put the dynamite of God in there. It'll change anybody. That's how powerful the gospel is. But we need to have a deep conviction that no matter who we are, whether we were put into a Christian family, a good family, or maybe a very bad family, God purposed you in that family. He put you there for a reason, to be shaped, perhaps even over time, even to be injured. So you could relate to a certain segment of society out there and be a testimony that the gospel can heal you. And we need to appreciate that God made us perfectly. And that God has a plan to prosper us and not to harm us. Yes, that's what God wants from us. Our three points today are pretty simple. Forever together, F. Number two, good luck is God's blessing, L. And number three, God picked your family, Y. The challenge today is to fly. You know, I was blessed... A couple weeks ago, it was Elena's birthday, and TJ and Casey uh, just so awesomely got, for Elena's birthday, tickets for us to go see this uh, musical called Wicked. And basically, the musical Wicked is the prequel, in other words, kind of the story before The Wizard of Oz. And what it's all about is titled Wicked because it's, it's, it's a fascinatingly done show, particularly for disciples. It's It's unbelievable. Because the whole premise of the musical is that the wicked witch of the West, remember the bad woman? She's actually the good one. It's Galinda the good that's really the one that's out there. The wizard is bad and the people of Oz have been faked out by sin and now consider the good bad or wicked and the wicked good and they want to kill the wicked. And that's the story. I won't, I won't mess it up for you. <laughs> the name of what we call the Wicked Witch of the West in the story is Elphaba. Or Elfie. And it's a very powerful thing because what it shows is that she came from very destitute past. I mean, even in the Wizard of Oz. Remember her skin was green? Yeah. Well, it's because her mom drank this green elixir that she was born green. She was born different. And people mocked her and hated her because she was different. But she was so idealistic. She wanted to help people by being the assistant of the wizard. But over time, people looked at her, mocked her, and hated her because of her convictions. And it came to a point where she even had to just take her stands, even when all of her friends... We're turning against her. At the end of the first act, she sings a song that I will never forget. The song is Defying Gravity. It means flying. (laughs) And some of the words are this. Something has changed within me. Something's not the same. I'm through with playing by the rules of someone else's game. Too late for second guessing. Too late to go back to sleep. It's time to trust my instincts, close my eyes, and leap. It's time to try defying defying gravity. I think I'll try defying gravity. And you can't pull me down. I'm through accepting limits, because someone says they're so. Some things I cannot change, but I don't if I don't try, I'll never know. Too long I've been afraid of losing loves I guess I've lost. Well, if that's love, it comes at much too great a cost. Everyone deserves a chance to fly. And if I'm flying solo, at least I'm flying free. To those who try to ground me, take a message back from me. Tell them how I'm defying gravity. I'm flying high, defying gravity. 
And soon my deed will resound. And nobody in all Oz, no wizard that there is or was, is ever going to bring me down. As disciples, we need to come under the wings of God. We need to rise upon those wings and fly. And let nobody, let nobody pull us down. And to God be the glory. Amen.